Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here today. I'm excited to talk about something that I'm passionate about. Uh, my name is Jeremy Andrus. I'm with Traeger Grills. And uh, I want to talk about something that I've learned uh, over the last few years of my career. Uh, I have come to believe deeply that the most important thing a CEO or, or any leader in an organization, for that matter, does is align the, the, the cultural values of that organization to his or her vision in a way that people understand, they believe in, and they know how to act on those values. Uh, it took me a while to figure this out. Uh, I certainly didn't learn it in my experience getting an MBA from Harvard Business School uh, over a great eight-year run uh, at Skull Candy, uh, helping build that brand. Again, it wasn't something that I really internalized. And so as I share an experience with you that had a lot of impact on me in my career, I'm hoping that you'll get a little bit closer to that uh, understanding uh, a little bit faster than I did. About four years ago, uh, I, was, uh, I had this great opportunity at Skull Candy. It was one of the best moments of my career, and I was looking at new opportunities. Um, I was picky. It had to be a perfect opportunity. Skull Candy had been such a great time for me to grow and to learn uh, as a professional, to build a brand, to meet great people, that I wasn't going to go for just any opportunity. Um, life was good. Uh, my Subaru was paid off, which felt really good. Uh, I had uh, four little girls, and uh, little did I know, uh, identical twin boys in the not too distant future. Um, and so I really needed something that gave me energy and gave me the desire to dig deep. Uh, in that process, I found this great old 30-year-old brand called Traeger Grills. Tucked up in the Pacific Northwest, it was an Oregon-based business, and I really fell in love with the brand. I remember going up there uh, as I was doing due diligence on the business and talking to consumers and hearing things that as a, as a consumer products guy just blew my mind. Um, I heard people say things like, this is the best consumer product I've ever owned, not the best grill, but the best product. I remember the first time uh, I was sitting with a, with a Traeger owner taking notes, and this person said, my Traeger changed my life. And I looked up from my notes, and I said, could you say that one more time? Uh, my Traeger changed my life. And I've heard that hundreds of times since. And I was fascinated by the energy of this brand that, I had, that had almost 30 years of history that I had never heard of. Uh, I will also tell you that something happens when you get on the inside of an organization that has a lot of history. Uh, it turns out that this organization was, was dysfunctional beyond belief. I, I, just, I just could not have imagined. I knew there was upside. I didn't know there was this much upside. And um, it broken from a strategy perspective, uh, operationally broken, um, you know, the, 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 the team was mostly weak, but I knew that if there was this much brand energy in the market, that I, could, that I and the team of guys that I brought on could, uh, could fix this business. What I hadn't understood was much more serious, and that's the more time that I spent in our office in Wilsonville, Oregon, the more I realized that the culture was toxic. It was a group of people that didn't want to be there, uh, they didn't trust me. They didn't trust each other. It was a job, and there was no intent to build anything ambitious. In fact, I, I later learned uh, that my nickname was Ocho, and that sort of sounded—you know—it sound, sounded kind of tough, a little bit mafioso, uh, <laughs> it, until I realized that it meant eight. Not a novel learning, um, <laughs> but that uh, I was going to be the eighth CEO fired from the company by the majority owner, who I learned was truly a bad guy, and we'll leave it at that. Um, and so I really didn't know how to fix this culture. I spent 10 months trying, building cultural values, trying to live the values, trying to empower the people to do the same, and it wasn't terribly successful. There was one day that came, came along where we had decided strategically one of the things that we had to do uh, was, was make a dramatic shift on our supply chain. Uh, we had a supply chain that would make the 1980s proud. Uh, we owned 
warehouses and forklifts and 18-wheel rigs. We had drivers on payroll. Uh, not the most uh, effective way to scale a business. And so uh, we stood in front of the warehouse team, and uh, we told them all of the reasons why we couldn't build this business with that, with that system in place. And we were super respectful of them. It's always hard to let people know who have families that you're going to be making changes and that their jobs would no longer be there. But in the process, we said, hey, listen, first of all, uh, this is going to happen for eight weeks. So anytime you want to go look for work on the clock, uh, take your time. Uh, second of all, the warehouse cross town, we partnered with UPS, was willing to hire any of those people. And if anyone got to the end of that eight-week period and, and, was not, and, and was not gainfully employed, we'd pay them a generous severance. It felt like the right thing to do. It was certainly the right thing to do strategically, and I was so cautious around how we managed that from a people perspective. Uh, the next time uh, I came to the office uh, in Wilsonville, I drove up with, uh, with a few of the executives uh, that had joined me, and uh, there was quite a scene. There were fire trucks, policemen, uh, the lights were, were bright, and one of our 18-wheel rigs was uh, on fire. Uh, it had been doused with fuel and uh, effectively melted to the ground. And uh, apparently there were members of the uh, warehouse team who we later learned didn't like the message that we had given them. Uh, this was a scary moment in my career. Um, I remember standing there talking to, uh, to a fireman, trying to understand what had happened. And you know, as I stand here today telling you the story, I remember the flickering flames that were still going, the smell of burning rubber, and thinking to myself, what in the world do I do now? Um, it was a, uh, the, 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 the morning got progressively worse. Uh, I huddled with uh, some key team members and we were trying to figure out what is the right thing to do? How do, how do, how do we manage through this situation? As we're huddled in this office, um, someone sees news of um, something that happened in a UPS facility uh, in Atlanta where a, a fired employee had come in uh, and shot and killed three people. Uh, and then 10 minutes later, someone from uh, the Wilsonville office poked his, head in, it poked his head in and said, hey, the ru rumors that something big is going down today. And so, uh, you know, as someone who was not a terribly experienced CEO, uh, I didn't know exactly how to handle this. Uh, I remember walking uh, to the bathroom trying to appear to be in charge and know, know what I was going to do, and looking in the mirror and saying, what in the world are you doing here? Like, you do this, you build businesses because you love it, and there is nothing to love in this moment. And um, I was scared. I didn't know what to do next. And I remember thinking, first of all, pull yourself together. Uh, if you don't, no one will. Uh, people need to seem, seek confidence. Uh, and then I needed to build a plan. And I will tell you that that was, after every, all of the adversity that I experienced in my career, that was the lowest moment. Uh, there were no... Harvard Business School cases that taught you what to do when people were burning your trucks down um, or, or when you felt unsafe. And, and we felt unsafe that day. And so I made a decision in that moment that I had to shut the office down. Uh, I couldn't change the culture. Uh, people that didn't want to follow were not going to make me their leader. Uh, and that uh, we had to start over. Uh, we, we had to build a team of people that bought into a culture that was aspirational, uh, that helped them be their best selves. And, um, and, 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 and I, I want to talk about those cultural values because those are really important to who Traeger has become. Um, what I realized most importantly is that it, 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 at our foundation, we don't change that much. And so as opposed to me trying to change people and teach them values that I believed in that, that they did not, I needed to take that as an opportunity for us to step back, define who we wanted to be, and recruit people that already bought into those values. 
uh, who lived those values before they came to Traeger. There are five key values, and we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we connect who we want to become from a vision perspective with the values that would motivate people as individuals and professionals to get better and to get there. Uh, the first is done, done, done. This for us is really, it's focusing on and emphasizing quality in everything that we do. It's easy to talk about uh, delivering a great experience to your customer, but it starts at ground zero. It starts in a home office where people believe that every time they participate in activity, every time that they hand something off, it is of the highest quality because that, that is the respect that they pay to their team members. The second is stand in the fire. Uh, I really believe that companies become great because they're willing to take risk. And when companies stop taking risks, they get stagnant, people get bored, uh, and, and, and companies really, they, they take a safe route. We really believe at, at, at Traeger that taking risk is important and taking smart risk is important. And there is no shame for taking risk and failing. We want our people to continue to take risk. We cook together. There are no individual heroes at Traeger. We don't celebrate, although we acknowledge great efforts, we win as a team. And we speak constantly about collaborating and ensuring that what we are building, we are building together. Uh, test kitchen mentality is around developing people. It's easy for companies to give lip service to investing in their people, but when you really create great opportunity and you provide guidance and, and resources and you hire high-octane people and you say, you know, go figure out how to do this. This is a big deal. Go figure this out. My experience has been that the right people rise to the occasion. And lastly, no reservations we truly obsess over the experience that our customers have. And um, I, I, I will tell you that a, as a leader, the most satisfying thing that I have felt has been watching the organization really embrace these values, live them, enforce them on themselves, and, and, and really motivate their peers to do the same thing. I could tell you countless stories and how I've seen people become great and make decisions and, and, and really do great things because of these cultural values. I want to focus on one, this last one that I put up there, no reservations. Um, about two years ago, uh, a, a guy named Rob uh, in, our, in our sales organization got a phone call on a Friday night on his cell phone. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a phone call from um, someone who worked in a Costco warehouse. Costco's an important customer of ours. And this person said, hey, Rob, um, I got a whole bunch of friends coming over for a football game and a party tomorrow evening. My Traeger's not working. What do I do? And um, Rob, who was fairly junior in the organization at the time, uh, without calling anyone, without asking permission, says, I'll be there in the morning. He could have said, let me see if I can find someone to help you in Seattle. He could have said, I'm so sorry, I've got a six-week-old kid, I can't make it. There are a whole bunch of things that he could have said, but what he chose to do was say, I'm going to buy a plane ticket tonight, I've got the part in the office, I'll be there by 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. He did it. He went to the office. Uh, you know, I, I can only, he, he knew it was wrong with the grill, I can only imagine the looks that TSA gave him when this uh, metal auger uh, comes through the security screener. Um, Rob went up there, he fixed the grill, he made sure it worked, he cooked with this guy. As soon as the party started, he got on a plane, he went back home to Utah. Um, he didn't tell anyone about this. Monday at about noon, this, this message has made it from the Costco warehouse member, to Costco corporate, to our VP of sales, and, uh, and he walks into my office. I thought it was so awesome that Rob didn't say, you know, he didn't hand it off. He didn't assume someone else would do it. It wasn't his job. He spends way more time behind spreadsheets and fixing augers on wood pellet grills. Uh, he could have done any of those things. He also didn't pick up the phone and ask permission to buy a ticket. 
to, uh, to, to Seattle. He simply did it because the values of this organization he knew empowered him to do that. He did the right thing, and I was so incredibly satisfied to hear that. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's always important to acknowledge that in any organization, if we can inspire people to do great things, we win. The difference between Traeger 1.0 in its first 26, 27 years of history and Traeger 2.0 is a team of people that bought into values that really reflect who we're trying to become. The financial difference is that we've grown from you know, a slow growth business that took nearly 30 years to get to $70 million in revenue. Four years later, we're north of $300 million in sales. The difference is the people and the cultural values that empowered them to be great. But I truly believe, and, I, and I've come to believe deeply as a leader, that more important than any financial result, and that truly is simply a result of the people and their efforts, um, but more important than that is the inputs, which are the people. I have, I, I have come to believe that five and 10 and 20 years from now, we won't look back and talk about shareholder value, stock price. Uh, we won't talk about the P&L, the balance sheet. We'll talk about people. And we'll talk about how the culture that we created led them to not only be great at Traeger, but really led to a trajectory in their career that changed them as people and allowed them to accomplish great things to come. Thank you.